by far the majority of my classmates, their parents were uh, employees of the American Embassy. Thank you, Hans, for taking the time to be here this morning. Well, thanks, and thanks for your interest. Uh, I am, yes, mm -hmm. most definitely. Mm -hmm. As I said before, I know very little. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know more, but I know that you were an ambassador before for the U.S., and your career diplomat. Did you was, 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 retired. You were, you retired. Yes. And you retired, what, you have to retire? Or is there an age limit? Uh, it's complicated. Um, in my case, I, uh, Internally, we use the term "ticked out." Uh, that, is, that is, I was. Uh, we have a very uh, um, rigid up and out system, and so if you're not promoted uh, within a certain period, um, you're, you're retired. I'm familiar with that in the military. Mm. They do the same thing mm. when you're going to yes, the rank uh, in the military. Right. If you don't get it within certain many times, exactly, you're out. Right. So, you. It's not. It's not like. They say when you're working 65 years old, you have to go. Uh, we have that as well, or the Foreign Service does, has both uh, a, a mandatory retirement age at 65, unless you are in a presidential appointment, um, or uh, retirement after um, reaching the maximum period in your class. Okay. So what did you do while you were in the, well, let's start off with where, where were you born? Um, Michigan, uh, in the Detroit suburbs. Okay. Do you have siblings? I do, uh, two sisters and a brother. And where do you rank in there? I'm at the, uh, I'm the oldest, let's put it that way. Yeah. So you, <laughs> <laughs> you caught yourself. <laughs> yes. Because they'll see this and they'll say, yeah, that's, that's Hans. He always <laughs> thinks he's at the top. <laughs> Are you close to your brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, um, close in uh, fam familial terms, but right. the, uh, far away in terms of Distance. geography. Yeah. Are you the only one that went into the diplomatic service? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is your father and mother? Are your mother and father still with us? No, no. They okay. both passed away. Right. Uh, my father was an engineer. Uh, my mother was a, she, she took care of the house. Took care of your house? Yeah. Right. Now, it was you, then who? Your brother? Brother and then two sisters. And what's the age difference between you and the, and the youngest? Um, seven years. Oh, then they keep you all close. Yes, you would be right, close. Right, the right. reason why I, I, I do this is because it helps to tell me what the dynamics were like in the family. Mm -hmm. If there's too much distance, Chances are they weren't close. Mm, yeah. If it's if it's really if it's more than three years and there's mm, just two kids, mm. they're not going to be that close. Mm. But if it's close, then yeah, that's well that's two, two, two yeah, yeah yeah. So you guys are really mm. close, mm. and it didn't probably matter any combination too. Right right. That's, right. that's you know, right. that's right. That's right. That's how my f I have four boys in six years. Mm. Oh, um, they're well, all that's very quick. close. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, once you get that, once you figure it out, you know, <laughs> you, you want to keep on going, and, you know, <laughs> until someone says mm -hmm. stop. Mm. So tell me, what was it like for you growing up? Uh, yeah, I had a, a very uh, a good childhood, I think. Um, we grew up in the Detroit suburbs, uh, and then moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and then eventually moved to Germany. My father worked for a company to transfer him around a little bit, okay, right. not as so much as in the military. So your father's German? Both my parents so uh, a German descent. That's why your name is Hans. That's right. They emigrated from Germany uh, after the war, after mm -hmm. World War Two, okay. in 1953. Did they speak German? Oh yes. Um, and when I was born, they were they weren't American citizens yet. They eventually uh, acquired American citizenship, and I they named me Hans. My father was also Hans, uh, but I think they were still a little bit uncertain whether they were going to stay in the United States at that time. All, all of my siblings were given pretty common American names. Such as? Yes. Stephen, Lori, Sally. But you were the first, so they didn't know. I, that's my guess. But did, you, did that plague you at all in school? Uh, Hans Ketchup. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it did. A little bit, a little bit, but not okay. uh, you know, actually surprisingly little. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right, what kind of child were you in school? Were you more academic or were you more sports-minded? Academic. Really? Yeah. Why was? It, why do? You, why would you think you? Uh, I never uh, played um, sports uh, until I got to college. Uh, really, ne never, you know, high school sports or anything like that. You just didn't have the interest, uh, or the skill. I think. Uh, Did mom read to you a lot, or your father? No, I read myself. I don't remember my parents reading to me. 
Right. Okay, and what kind of books did you like to read? Um, encyclopedias. You did the the Botanica. You did the encyclopedias. Well, I started book? with you know kind of more uh, encyclopedias that were written for kids, but uh, and I, what did I, what A kind of through Z, you know. And you just went for it. So you were just broadly interested in everything. You would just find out about the world. R yes, I guess that's a good way to describe it. Okay. Yeah. Then, would, okay, as you got older, where did you start to hone your interest? Uh, eventually, found um, an affinity for history, and so. Which history? Um, well, mostly American and then uh, European history. Uh, one thing I, uh, I'm jumping way ahead, but uh, one of the um, reasons I'm so grateful for having had the opportunity to serve as an American diplomat was that the Foreign Service, like the military, sends you uh, around the world and sometimes to places that you've never even imagined that you find yourself in, and that's what happened to me. Uh, at one point they sent me to Korea, and I had really no background whatsoever in Asia up until that point. And so uh, it was a you know, entirely new, fundamentally new world for me. Uh, was this one of your first polls? Uh, it was my second. So were you still single? Uh, no, uh -huh. I was married by that time. Right. Well, let's okay. Let's get up. Yeah, to sorry. So, <coughs> no, no, I like that. Yeah. So, so you, so you, so you went through school, majoring in what? When you got into high school, would you start to focus on um, history mostly? Um, I was pretty good in math, and I enjoyed that. And this is in Kentucky, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Correct. Okay, Louisville, green grass. <laughs> the Derby. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. my goodness. Mm. All right. So it's a beautiful state. Anyway. So how did you? How did you escape the accent? So I, I moved there pretty uh, late. I was ten years old, okay. and then left when I was fifteen. So didn't okay, so you didn't get that much time. time. Yeah, right. they didn't get to really no. get in there. No. And where'd you go when you left at fifteen? Uh, to Germany. So your parents, everyone, packed up and went to Germany. Yes. Where in Germany did you go? Uh, we lived in Bonn. Um, okay. My father worked in Cologne, uh, okay. uh, which is right up the river. So what was it like going to Germany? Now you, but had, did, had they raised you speaking English and German? Um, for a period, and then when um, in elementary school, like first, second grade or so, I had some speech difficulties and. Uh, my parents were counseled to only speak one language. They thought the, the mix of the language was contributing to some uh, speech impediments that I had. Um, and unfortunately, they took it seriously and, and we stopped speaking German at home. And so I'm, I'm, I lost fluency in German okay. as a result, oh. unfortunately. Is that right? So what was it like when you went to Germany? Because I'm sure they weren't speaking to you only in English. No, that's right. Uh, I, I had a, had still a basic understanding. Uh, my uh, reading was a little bit more difficult, but the, uh, my oral understanding of, of German was still pretty good. Um, and I, I I took the the opportunity. So I was already in twelfth grade by this time. And uh, did, you, did you go to an all German school? Did you go to an international school? No, I went school? to just like here in American, American school. school. Right. Okay. Right. The, that's you know. Bonn was the capital of, of West Germany, and that's where our embassy was. And right. the embassy had a, an American high school. Right. And it, doesn't the Rhine go through there? It does. It does. And did you belong to the club there? I believe. Sure did. The American club there? Yes. Yeah. My parents were members. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Why oh yeah. Know? We went there well, I don't almost know so every. Much about it. Okay. You've been there too. Yes, uh, I've been yeah, there. Yes. I've, yeah. We went there almost every Sunday for so brunch or dinner. So you had your community, right? You had your community mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Mm -hmm. So you only did the one year there? The right. And then I graduated from high school and went back to the States to uh, go to college. Would you get a well, history major, but that's what you did in high school. Then when you went to college, what were your aspirations? Uh? Well, <coughs> so um, Bond played a, in my year there, played a very important uh, role in f shaping my future. So. But how so? Why? So uh, we lived. Uh, a German uh, suburb of, of Bonn, but I went to the Bonn American High School. And all of my, not all, but uh, by far the majority of my classmates, their parents were uh, employees of the American Embassy. And so it was my first exposure to 
diplomacy to the role of an embassy to foreign and in international relations, um, the workings of, of government relations. Um, and I found it very, very interesting, um, just through the exposure, you know, through my classmates to what their parents did. And, it, and I, I, I learned about the, the American diplomatic service, the, the foreign service, um, uh, the requirements to join the, the State Department and the Foreign Service. So I always had that in the back of my mind as I went to school, uh, to university, uh, as a possible uh, career. And it worked out. Um, in my junior year in, in college, I took the Foreign Service exam. In your junior year? Yes. Okay. Um, and then by the time I graduated, I, I, I passed all the requirements and entered the Foreign Service. So you were ready to go. I was. Uh, extremely fortunate that it all worked out. That's right. Mm. That's not an easy thing to do. Mm. And I'm sure a lot of other people tried, mm. and they're doing other jobs right now. And right, right, <laughs> right, right. Okay, so what happened when you first got in? I mean, so first you were elated when you did it. Your mom and dad were happy too? Uh, yes. Um, they were a little bit, I think, uncertain about what this meant, you know, both in terms of career, but also uh, the requirement to live overseas all the time. Uh, but uh, yes, they were very uh, happy, I think. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, was your dad more, did he ever try to guide you in any particular direction? Um, not strongly. Every once in a while he would express um, some aspiration, both for me and my brother. Uh, at one point, for example, uh, we should tr travel a lot in the summers. Uh, Where, in Europe? No, th when we were growing up in the United okay. States, okay. Uh, when we were in, particularly when we were in Kentucky, uh, we would always take a summer trip, mm -hmm. um, and often we'd go to Florida. Mm -hmm. But one time we uh, drove out to Colorado and we visited the um, the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And I, I remember afterwards, my dad saying, "I just don't understand you, you guys, why you don't want to be." an engineer and then and join the Air Force. I, I just don't get it, why that doesn't, why that isn't. He'd, he'd been mentioning that to you. Obviously. No, no, he had not. <laughs> so this came out of the blue, uh, kind of? Kind of, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. but he's an engineer and uh, he loved a mechanical engineer. Okay. And he loved taking engines apart and putting them back together. And uh, it was something that I always found just incomprehensible, frankly, and it, I, I never had that 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 knack or that interest. And but uh, he did, and and he really he expressed this bewilderment that you you're, you're American kids and you have this opportunity to study to be an, an engineer or and then join the. Uh, the American Air Force and, and, and study in this beautiful place in Colorado Springs, why don't you do it? <laughs> um, <coughs> so. And both you and your brother had the same feeling about, eh. <laughs> Well, I certainly did. My, my brother went on to be a, a engineer also, uh, so he had a little bit of right, the knack. Right, right. <laughs> right. Your dad gave him the final pitch, <laughs> push right. and he went into right. it. Right. That's interesting. Mm. I think it's always interesting how parents have this preconceived idea about what their kids are going to be like and, and try to mold them mm. Mm. in some sort mm. of way. Mm. But I think we can't help ourselves. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> so tell me, okay, so now you get into the Foreign Service. What was the first thing they had you do besides uh, um, stamp visas? <laughs> no, I stamp visas. You have to. <coughs> listen, you've got to right, do the grunt work. Right, right. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, you've got you to earn your, your right. badges. Yeah. Um, no, I did that for 30 months, uh, <laughs> first in Trinidad and Tobago, um, and then in Korea. And, and looking oh, back so on... So Korea was your second one, but you yes. now you're already married now. We, my wife and I, my first wife, oh, uh, we, married we got married in uh, uh, Tobago, yes. Mm. Okay. Mm. That was my, uh, those were my responsibilities. First mm. uh, immigrant visas, and then, no, sorry, first non-immigrant visas, then immigrant visas, and then... Uh, finally worked on American Citizen Services. Okay. Which so like can marriage? be really interesting uh, work. Well, yes, marriage. <coughs> Childbirth. Um, um, uh, and then also 
uh, taking care of Americans who find themselves in distress uh, overseas. Um, have you been to Trinidad? Do you no, know? I haven't. No. So it's I've in been, the I've Caribbean. Yeah. No, I've been to um, St. Croix, St. Kitt, oh. St. Martin. Mm. Oh. Mm. I've been to Haiti because mm. I was stationed in Puerto Rico. Oh. Mm. Yeah. So I was stationed there for a year and a month. Roosevelt Roads. Uh. Rosie, Rosie Roads, but mm. I was at Rainey Air Force Base. Oh, I see. You know, and we closed it down. We had to close mm. down the base. Mm. And it was right on a cliff. We'd fly out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you came back in in rainstorm, you always worried mm -hmm. if you get a downdraft just mm -hmm. before you got over that cliff. <laughs> that cliff. Oh. But anyway, <coughs> so yeah, Rosie, so you know the area. I've um, never been to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico but yes. uh, uh, my ambassador in Trinidad, he was actually from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Okay. And, uh, for whatever reason, whenever he went back to Washington, he always stopped at Roosevelt Roads. Rose. Mm -hmm. I think that was the Navy base, I believe, mm -hmm. Rosie Roads. Mm -hmm. right. um, so <coughs> Trinidad is uh, one of the things it's famous for is its carnival, um, which takes place at every, you know, before Lent, <coughs> and it's an incredible event. Um, I, Germany also you know, has large Catholic areas, and uh, Cologne, in particular, has a, also has a, is famous for its carnival, uh, which I participated in or watched when I was living there. But Trinidad's in it's entirely entirely different league. It's and you had never been anything like this. No. Okay. <laughs> and um, getting a little bit off the track, but uh, uh, during Carnival, it, um, a lot of American tourists uh, visit the island. Um, and so, about a week after C Carnival or so, um, we uh, hear of reports of an American uh, woman who had been arrested. Uh, she was uh, found uh, out in the countryside, uh, naked, walking down the street. And this is a woman probably in her th uh, 30s at the time or so. So she was, she was having some, some psychological issues. And um, Trinidad did have some uh, facilities uh, for uh, 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 people um, who were uh, suffering from psychological uh, stress, and um, uh, we received report that she would, had been I institutionalized there. Um, when an American is arrested overseas, the obligation is that for the arresting um, uh, country has to inform the, the U.S. Embassy uh, within 24 hours. And, and usually the, it works. Uh, often the, 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 uh, the period of when they inform the embassy of, of the arrest or <coughs> uh, that something that had happened to the American citizen, it's, they report right away. Uh, in any case, we learned right after her, um, after she was uh, put into custody, okay. uh, uh, we were told, and so I was working then at, in the counselor section, but for the uh, American Citizen Services Unit, and my boss said, Hans, uh, go to the facility and check out uh, uh, how she's doing. And so I went, and so was, this was the initial interview, the initial report, and she was in just terrible shape, <laughs> terrible shape. Uh, was she cognitive as to what was going oh, on? Oh yeah, and she was very, very upset that she had been, uh, you know, put into custody as she was being held, and she was upset with me. I mean, it was a very un uh, uncomfortable uh, interview. Uh, so she was angry, um, and <laughs> and so I went back to the embassy and and, and followed our, my report, and then a couple of days later. Uh, went back and, and, and she had, uh, maybe it was the next day, uh, she had ca calmed down a bit. Um, uh, uh, she had had a chance to bathe and shower. Uh, she was getting uh, food. And so she was definitely on a, on a path of, uh, you know, of improvement. Our goal was as quickly as possible to get her back to the United States. That, that, that's always the, um, the objective when something like this occurs when somebody's either arrested or put into custody or otherwise in trouble. The goal is always to get them back to their family in the United States. So <coughs> from the very beginning, that that's 
that's our objective. Um, problem is that she's been in institutionalized. Right? So it's just a, you know, within, all of this happens within a couple of days. Um, one day I'm, I'm in the embassy <coughs> at my desk in my office and I look up and she's standing in front of my desk. Oh, I know. How much time has passed? I would say maybe four days. Had you witnessed her getting out? No. <laughs> so, so I visited probably here, you know, a day or, or two before, and I, I what I, uh, both my boss and I, we kind of foresaw that, you know, I'd be routinely be visiting well, that's what her, you're expecting. Okay, right. and at some at some point she'd be released and, and able to go home. So, so your understanding was that she'd been put in; she's going to stay there until she gets better. And you'd seen her about two times or something. Two or three times. Time. That's right. First time she was. Completely, completely a mess, right. um, angry, distressed, right. dirty. Right. Um, you know, the next day or two days later, she was in better shape, right. um, and, and she was on this track of improvement. But, uh, and I'm not a, a physician or a psychologist or anything like that, but I could tell that she was under some um, mental. Uh, no one had taken her blood to find out if she'd been drugged or anything like that. Uh, or you I don't know. What we happened. hadn't, but and, and no, I, no. I don't recall. Probably okay. somebody did. Yeah. Okay. And, in any case, uh, <laughs> she's standing in front of your desk. desk exactly. Which and is, you know, when you think about it now, to get into an yeah, embassy. So I'm just trying to say. Yeah, right. I mean, this is the 1983, so it's a little bit different. Of course, it's different. Um, <laughs> Maybe they thought she worked there. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. So <laughs> anyway. what did she do? What did she do? She, she says, "I want to go home. Get me out of here." Oh, so she knew exactly, she, she met, she knew you and everything, so she came to you and said, Get me out of here. Look. And did you uh, oblige? Uh, yes. Okay. This is kind of the marvelous thing about, the, about American <laughs> diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, my, my boss, he, he's, uh, you know, in, in the Foreign Service, uh, Lance, you know, we have these, these career tracks. You know, there's an economic officer, a political officer, a management officer, right. a public affairs officer, and then we have counselor officers. Right. And, and uh, people who choose that career track, you know, work essentially most of their pro pro professional life on managing our visa operations and, and also our, our citizen services uh, operations overseas. And, and they're professionals. And so my boss had been doing this for 30 years. And he, it's part of his work, it's part of his uh, kind of network that he has to establish when he goes to a new country is, is um, knowing the, the police, right? And, and knowing all the, the, the authorities uh, who uh, are responsible for areas of, 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 of his responsibility. And um, <laughs> so I remember talking to him and, and uh, it's kind of remarkable. He said, okay, let's get her out of here. And so uh, this is like three in the afternoon and the next flight to Miami is at you know, uh, 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Is that where she lived in Miami? No, but that's the okay, entry the point. Oh, entry point, okay. And then and maybe she was from Florida. I don't is know. that, and then from there, did you guys give her enough to get to where she said she's from or just to the States? Yeah, so there's a, <laughs> um, a mechanism that okay. the State Department has, um, first of all, to contact the family, uh, if necessary to provide a, a short-term loan. Um, uh, the counselor, uh, most counselor offices around the country all of us have a little bit of cash on hand. And so we lent her 50 bucks um, and we uh, uh, very quickly, it's amazing looking back on it, how quickly we were able to move. We got her um, adequate money to buy a, a, a plane ticket one way back to the United States. And the most remarkable thing is that my boss, using his contacts with the Trinidadian police, got her passport. Okay. <coughs> kind of a, as a favor. Okay. You know? Just to make sure she's. Well, no, it's, I mean, uh, a favor from the police. Oh, you know? the police will give it, come back to you. Okay. Well, you have to build up that relationship. Exactly. You don't exactly. Have it. If you don't exactly. have a good relationship, you can forget exactly. Exactly. how effective are you going to be. Exactly. Make. So that was one of your first experiences in the foreign service. Yeah, and it was remarkable, okay. you know. And turned dead. And then from there, then you went to Korea for the first time. Right, right. right. And as, as I said earlier, uh, my focus always had been on, you know, I grew up in Detroit and Louisville, Kentucky, then lived in Germany, 
studied history, but it all is mostly European, European American right. so you history. So hope, you kind of hoping, I would think, that you could do something in Europe, maybe go precisely. to France, precisely. maybe go into precisely. You know, precisely. Brussels, something like that. Exactly, and I tried very hard, <laughs> um, but it, it didn't work out. So when you're going from your first tour to your second tour, uh, you know, the competition is pretty tough. You don't have connections um, which you can build to try to, you know, get get somebody more senior to weigh in on your behalf mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. personnel system to to take you to Paris or to right. Brussels or to Belgrade or, right. or wherever you might want to go in Europe. Um, I went through three or four bid lists. You know, the kind of minimum is six. And what do you mean? What do you what, what do you mean? So I, I submitted my first bid list. I think back then the, the minimum number of bids you have to put in was six, and the right. maximum was <laughs> twenty or something. Okay. You mean when you say a bid, each place is considered a bid. Yeah, each position. So you, on a list, you have six choices. Right. Okay. I got you. Okay. Yeah, and uh, f first one, you know, complete washout. Second bid? one, complete washout. Right. Um, Had you put Korean on there? So when I p was putting my third bid list together, <laughs> and, and my uh, boss was uh, trying to be very helpful, he said, Hans, I see you know, Seoul, Korea, uh, on the list. Um, you ought to really con give some uh, hard thought to, to Korea. He had just come from Korea. Um, he was a Japanese-American and served uh, mostly in, in Asia. He, uh, before Trinidad, he uh, had worked in Korea, and he said it, it's, uh, it's a fascinating place, big embassy, uh, interesting job, you, you'll, you'll like it. So give some hard thought to Korea. I did so reluctantly because you know, I'd, I'd, I'd never studied Asian anything. I, uh, growing up in Louisville and Michigan and Indiana, I never had a, an Asian Friend, friend. I mean, right. acquaintances, yes, but right. n nothing close. So you hadn't given any real serious thought, any more than someone coming from Mars. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, so, so you get to Korea. What were your experiences then? But you're married now. Yes. All right, with your first wife. Right. And you go to Korea. Right. She's from the states as well. She's from Indiana. Yes. Indiana. Okay. So you go there. What, what was? What were your first experiences? And well, what year was this, by the way? So this is uh, 1984. Okay. I remember it well. Yeah, it was still a military <laughs> dictatorship. Yes, uh, and you had to be in by 12 o'clock. It I was under curfew, no, that's I right. Know, I know, most definitely, yeah. because that's when they moved their tanks, and because they were assuming they are always going to be hit. Yeah. So they'd yeah. move their tanks on those big roads. I think the curfew was lifted at the end of yeah. 1984. Right. Um, they had, the, yeah. yeah. So you were, were you there, at Osan you or something? No, I was no, no. Yeah. But I was, uh, well, I was stationed here in '74. Oh, I see. And that's where we went to get all of our clothes made. I see. In Itaewon. <laughs> in Itaewon. Yes. And the base was right there. The yes. army base yes. was right there. Right. Right. And Hamilton Hotel. Mm. That's where we stayed. Mm. You know, when we yeah. went there, yeah. the Air Force. So I'd go down there. We go to Itaewon, get all of your leather goods made, your yep. shoes yep. made, your yep. s everything, suits, yep. and hope that your sleeve doesn't fall off after <laughs> the thread comes out. <laughs> But what we we got we got smart, we started we st we got smart and started bringing thread from here, enough to give them some and use this on my suit, please. Because if you just brought enough for mm. you, you weren't going to get your suits mm. sewn up mm. right. Because that mm. was the only thing. The material was mm. okay. Mm. It was the thread. They mm. used this cheap cotton thread, mm. and all of a sudden you'd be walking, your right. sleeve would go blue. Wow. You know, <laughs> <laughs> something in your lapel would just <laughs> open up. That was about it. Mm. But I enjoyed going there. But it always sounded to me like they were arguing with each other. Yeah, well, the language Koreans, itself yeah. sounded like, they were, uh, but then you'd mm. see how they react, and there would mm. be no physical kind, mm. just, uh, just the language seemed hard. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, what was your experience? Well, um, I was blown away uh, by by this place. You know, okay, what, what blew you away? What things? Well, first, I uh, I never lived in a big city before, so living oh really right downtown uh, in Seoul uh, was something new. Um, just the, um, well, all the differences, of course, um, but also kind of the, the pace and the size of things. But you're still not, you're still doing grunt work and stuff, right? Uh, for promoted? the first year, um, it was what we call a rotational position. So the first year was, again, council work and, again, non-immigrant visas. Uh, immigrant visas and then American citizen services. Korea ha at that time had a 
big uh, uh, issue with fraud, um, uh, with Koreans trying using fraudulent method methods to uh, qualify for a visa, and so there was also oh. a fraud unit within the counselor oh. section. Spent some time there, but then after the first year, I, I moved into the economic section. I, I was hired as an economic track officer, okay. and so is that something you wanted? Uh, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I very much in, enjoyed the the work uh, during most of my career uh, as a economic officer, working on mostly uh, trade policy issues, but also had a chance to work on uh, financial services. Uh, Later on, working on agricultural trade and biotechnology. Uh, but anyway, did uh, you did you see Korea get into the stage they are now? When you were there, did you think they would? Because they have always felt they were second place to Japan. Right, right. And, and I think now they were. Now they've overtaken Japan. You think so? In terms of uh, per capita GDP. GDP oh, GDP. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, in rea reality, well, yeah, in reality, yeah, now. they probably. Yeah, I still have everyone in Japan wants, I mean, everyone in Asia wants to think they've overtaken Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think they're just, Japan's very mm, quiet mm, about mm, it because mm. they did all the investment in Korea, mm, mm, China. Mm, mm, they, th mm, that's their mm, money. Mm, mm, mm. Anyway, that's right, another, right. another thing. Uh, Korea was growing very rapidly. Uh -huh. uh, I think our general sense was that um, they're on the on road to success, that they were doing the right things in terms of educating their people, uh, and making investments in, in infrastructure education. Um, and you could see the, the companies, uh, uh, the big Chaba were, you know, very, very successful. Um, back then, it was steel, uh, shipbuilding, uh, automobiles are beginning to uh, export uh, right. to the, both the United States and to Europe. Um, I remember going to the Samsung semiconductor facilities, and you know this is back in again 1984, 1985. I had no idea that Samsung was going to be a, you know the one of the leading companies in terms of both semiconductor engineering manufacturing, but then also uh, smartphones and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, I mean, looking back on it in particular, I could see the seeds of success were were were, were in place. Yeah. Okay. So then, from there, when you left Korea, did you go? Is that when you went over? Then I came to Japan. So you've been uh, in Japan too. Yes, I uh, first at the embassy here. Yes, three w times. Actually. What year was that? I first uh, served here in 1987. One of our f first trips uh, after we got to uh, Korea was to visit a friend here in Japan a classmate of mine who was at the U.S. Embassy at the time. And, uh, yeah, I found it very, very intriguing. And so worked hard to uh, try to get a job here and succeeded. And so in 1986, my wife and I we entered Japanese language training back in, in Washington. Then we arrived here in February of 87. Hmm. And uh, then for really about 20 years, my career focused on Japan. Served at the embassy here three times, and also under who? Du, du, du. Mansfield, Armacost, uh, Foley, and Schieffer. Foley and Schieffer, I know well. Mm -hmm. And Master Foley, I really knew him well because he'd come out here and work all the time, work out here yes, at, the, right. at the old club. Right. And matter of fact, I know his um, trainer, mm -hmm. Mark. Mm -hmm. He was really into martial arts. Uh, oh, was he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what's, what style? Like could Brazilian. I Brazilian. Mm. Oh, mm. that's why he had. Mm. Mm. You'd never know it. Mm. I don't think he had kids either, did he? Foley didn't have children. I think it was just he and his wife. I don't if think so. Yeah, I don't right. recall ever. Because I used to go there, and I have lots of pictures of me mm. and Foley and my mm. wife and his wife. I don't think he had kids. Yeah, he also really liked sumo. I mean, did he? Yeah, okay. I became his sumo control officer. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. Really? Yeah, yeah. Whenever That's uh, he wanted to see sumo, he, he I get a call. Uh, okay. Mm. So then, when you finish, okay, so you wrapped up your career. You spent twenty years here, but then you, you obviously. Well, the interesting, as we discussed, the interesting about the foreign service is that it sends you in different directions. At one point, it sent me to Asia, and then later, um, tremendous diversity in the foreign service. Uh, geographic, obviously, because you can. You know, we have embassies in 
almost every country, um, depending on your interests, you go Latin America, Asia, what have you, but also a tremendous functional diversity. Um, as I mentioned, we have these five career tracks. You're not locked into them, you can move around. And at one point, um, I started working in management rather than uh, uh, economics. And so I started working in, in, hu in HR in particular. Um, and the last 15 years of my career were really focused on working in HR, which I found uh, really uh, very rewarding. Enjoyed it very much. Well, you're dealing with people. I mean, you. I mean, all the time. Everyone that comes in. Right, exactly. Anyone that exactly. comes in. Anyone exactly. that's ready to go out. I had. I'm exactly. sure you had to do entry and exit. Oh yes. Oh yes. Right. And discipline. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> you were in charge of the discipline. Oh, sure. Or yeah. just not disciplining, but just finding out why. Conduct and discipline. Yeah. Oh really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's part of HR. And that's when you went to Lithuania. Uh, not Lithuania. Romania. Romania. Okay. Right. So. Um, yeah, that's my my career ended in Romania. In Romania, yeah. is that the only position, that the t only time you held the position of ambassador? No, uh, ten years prior, I was ambassador to Timor Leste, East Timor. No, uh, who, who was the president then? Uh, it was the uh, same guy who's president now, uh, Ramos Horta. No, I'm not talking about. Oh, there. our president. Our president. Our president. Uh, yeah. President Bush. Okay, so you're close with him. I wasn't. No, no, no. I, how, so do you, how do you get your? Wait. How do you get? Put. I thought the president picks who he wants to be in the positions. So there's uh, two main tracks. Okay. <coughs> uh, one is uh, the career career track. So about two thirds of our em ambassadors. It change. It fluctuates a little bit, but roughly two thirds of our ambassador, and there's like, like 240, are career okay. members of the foreign service, okay. mostly from the State Department, but also from. Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture, USAID. And they can be from any of those departments and still become ambassadors? Yes. Okay. All right. um, and there's a competitive process um, managed by the State Department to select those uh, individuals. And then there are always um, uh, um, chosen and nominated by the President. Okay. But uh, Every single one? Yes. Supposedly. No, no. They are. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah, the, the, you, your name doesn't get to the Senate unless it, you're nominated by the President. Okay. Uh, and then the Senate confirms uh, the, all the selectees, right. all the nominations, right? right. So there's a, a competitive process that the State Department manages, uh, and then the selectees are, are, um, are given to the White House for uh, uh, review and concurrence, and then the President nominates. But President doesn't know Hans Clem. He doesn't know. Yes. Okay. But some of them he does know. So, uh, yes, because they they've worked at the White House. Are they donated uh, a lot? No, that's that's a different track. Okay. So, so two thirds. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you think you're talking about career now? Right. Career has nothing to do with that. They're just in the State Department. I hear. You. Right. And if they get elected, it's because of their hard work and their exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. And then <laughs> the other third are uh, selected entirely by the White House. It's a black box. We don't we don't look into it. Uh, there's um, uh, they run their own. Um, uh, they have a personnel office and they uh, run their That's own the process. That's the Captain Kennedys and yes, exactly. Right, right. And Tom Schieffer's. Tom Schieffer's, right, right, right. The Ruses, and right. Stuff. The, the Rahm right. Emanuels. Right. Okay. Right. Could they? Is it possible? Because I'm seeing Caroline Kennedy's an ambassador again. Yeah. Uh, and Tom Schieffer served oh, twice. He, he did. Yeah. yeah and uh, how, how, what's the longest you've heard of someone who isn't career serving? Mike Mansfield. He wasn't, he wasn't. No, he was a former Senate Majority Leader. I didn't realize that. I yeah. thought he was part of the Foreign Service. No, he came up no, that route. No, no. He, he was, was a politician. He was an extraordinary man. Yeah, he I mean, certainly was. That was, yeah. I, mean, I could see him being, he could be anywhere he mm. wanted to be. Mm. He's Very mm. soft spoken, didn't mm. have a lot to say, but when he did, mm. you should listen. Mm. Hmm. I really like the man. Mm. Yeah, so guy. yeah, he was uh, the yeah. first ambassador I worked for here in Japan. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and I hear that was he fluent in Japanese? No, no, he wasn't. No. Who was fluent? In, uh, that was um, someone else. Mm. I'll come to me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, your first post was as ambassador was uh, um, East Timor. East Timor. Mm. And how long was the term? Two Three years. years. Three years. Yeah. How was that for you? Uh, that was uh, 
Being in the new post and the area you're in. Right. Um, and the, the, the country. Um, Timor-Leste uh, was a former Portuguese colony, and then in 1975 uh, it declared independence, and nine days later it was invaded by Indonesia. And then for 25 years it was uh, under Indonesian occupation, sometimes an extraordinarily brutal occupation. Um, but uh, the Timor Timorese uh, had a uh, both uh, within the country and outside the country had a very determined resistance to Indonesian occupation, and eventually they, um, under, uh, with under the UN, secured uh, the ability to have a um, a referendum on whether they should be whether the country should be independent or remain uh, occupied or part of Indonesia. And they, this was in 1999, and they voted overwhelmingly more than 90% for, for independence, and then became an independent country five years or three years later in 2002. <coughs> um, but it uh, emerged as a newly independent country with no institutions, with um, 400 years of co colonial rule and then 25 years of brutal occupation, um, and, lot and, and very, very poor. Um, and uh, the first, I'd say, ten years of, of independence was uh, very uh, difficult for the country. They had some, um, within the security sector, the police and the, the military, they had some uh, uh, very, very um, unre unresolved tensions in terms of of uh, responsibility okay. for security, and, and they wound up unable to manage those those conflicts and in 2006 uh, the country fell into uh, collapse particularly in the capital with the military and, and the police in, in armed conflict against each other and uh, I arrived a, a year later and uh, our goal was to uh, uh, the international community's goal was to do what it could to uh, put uh, uh, Timor on a path both uh, towards economic and social development, but also um, stability, internal stability, and, and resolving uh, some of the, the conflicts that emerged out of the, uh, particularly the, the occupation period. And being an ambassador there, how do you take it? I mean, you're being driven around, right? Or were you doing yeah. the You're yeah. being driven around. People are looking at you, knowing that you're someone important. Yeah. Not necessarily knowing what you do. Right. How did they react to you? Uh, usually with incredible uh, kindness. And Once they found out that you were the U.S. ambassador? Uh, I think in, in general, uh, there, were not, there were not that many foreigners in, in, okay. in Timor. Uh, uh, it wasn't a, a tourist destination, uh, even though it has great scuba diving, I'm told. Um, it's a rugged, beautiful country, great, just tremendous trekking opportunities. What so is their natural resource if they have any? Um, energy. They have both oil and gas. And so they have an opportunity there to capitalize on those resources. Who was, was it being pillaged before? No, no, or it had really hadn't been, been it had just been discovered okay. and it really hadn't been developed. It, was, it only really uh, started to come online when I was there back in 2006, 2007. And uh, they did some very, very wise things. They set up a sovereign wealth fund that, that um, took the, um, uh, the revenues from uh, their uh, energy resources uh, and, and saved them for you know, use by future generations. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, investing that money in, in ways uh, that uh, uh, provides for for infrastructure mm -hmm. for education, um, was it was a challenge because I mean, again these uh, was a country with you know no f uh, functioning institutions before two thousand and two and so everything was being built while. Where, where would you find Timor today? Um, so uh, f fortunately, um, the uh, in terms of its in internal institutional uh, 
functioning. It's, it's doing very well. Um, uh, with the help of the international community, the Timorese uh, took steps like uh, developing a um, national security strategy, which identified what the roles of the military and the police would be to provide some clarity about um, uh, about their functions so they weren't in, in conflict. And, and since 2008, uh, the country has enjoyed just really tremendous political stability. Uh, uh, routinely has uh, elections for parliament, for president, and uh, it's been functioning very well. It, it still has, it's still a poor country. Um, it, uh, in addition to its own uh, resources, financial resources. It's also getting support from like the Asian Development Bank and, and from the uh, international community, including from the United States. <coughs> uh, we're also investing in uh, infrastructure in, in Timor. Uh, so it, it, it's going, it, it's, I think it's going to have a, a challenge uh, um, like all, all countries do in, in finding ways to uh, organize its, its economy ways to ensure but it is still growth. independent oh yeah oh yeah, it's it's oh yeah. it recently yeah. joined ASEAN uh, the Association of Southeast Asian mm -hmm. uh, nations so um, was I it because China's investing a lot in there China's also very <coughs> much a partner well people are getting well I'm not at this I don't want to get political mm. anyway mm. <laughs> so then after that your post was uh, Afghanistan and that you invested there no oh, okay no, no, no. Um, uh, I went to uh, Afghanistan at the kind of height of our surge uh, in Afghanistan. So this was 2010, 2000. What was, what was your function there? I, I was in charge of um, uh, our rule of law and anti-corruption programs, counter-narcotics. Oh, okay. All right. mm. oh. So you, so then from there, when you, you became an ambassador after that, after you finished Afghanistan? I went back to Washington and then was the head of uh, HR for the Department of State, um, and then went out to Romania in 2015. And that was your last tour? Right. <coughs> and in Romania, that, how, long was, how long were you there? Four years. Four years. Mm -hmm. and what was that like? Because I'm sure you didn't expect to go to Romania. No, I didn't. Uh, again. <laughs> that was Europe, but far, far. Yes. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, it was great. It was, uh, first of all, Romania is a beautiful country. Um, very varied um, geography, landscapes. Um, uh, we have a uh, tremendously close relationship with Romania and the United States in terms of our, our strategic partnership. They're a member of NATO. Um, very, um, they're, on the, uh, they're on the Black Sea, so they're very close to Russia and they're very concerned about Russia, and this was before the invasion of Ukraine. Um, well, actually, it was after the invasion of Crimea. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, we had a very a close security relationship with Romania. Um, we had growing economic uh, ties. Um, the kind of the major challenge that we had was, uh, and it was a Romanian challenge, is that they still had problems with corruption. And, and we were what type of corruption? Political uh, corruption. Oh, corruption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's easier if, if you if you have the means. It's easier for you to get things done there. Mm. If you, mm. you know. right, right. Is it still that one? I I think they've made a lot of progress uh, in fighting corruption. Um, they had a when I was there, they had a they had set up a special agency to investigate. Uh, 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 allegations of, of corruption. No, who, the Romanians had set this up? Yeah, yeah. So what was it like for you there for four years? Yeah, no, it was great. Uh, again, the Marines are very fond of, of the United States. There, There is a pretty strong Romanian community in the U.S., about a million. Um, they uh, considered us, you know, even though they were a member of the European Union, a very important uh, ally. Um, they were very generous to the uh, American Embassy staff, but particularly the ambassador. We we traveled a lot. We um, uh, and, and during our travel, it wasn't just to sightsee. You know, we we met with R Romanian uh, leadership, but also uh, with Romanian people around the country. And yeah, and right there on the Black Sea, they have a strategic advantage. So I could see where that or could be. Or vulnerability. Right, right, right. Do we have bases there? 
Uh, we had, uh, when I was there, we had about a thousand American personnel in Romania at any one time. We had a fairly uh, significant base on the Black Sea uh, near Constanza. Means, right. But most importantly, we also had an uh, anti ballistic missile defense facility. Right Set up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone else, is anyone else there? Like, is Japan there? Is uh, France, uh, France, uh, France no. is there? Uh, France has, as part of the NATO alliance, has okay. um, personnel there. And there was also a they had an exchange program with the Polish military, so okay. there was a platoon plus of Poles in, in Romania uh, at any one time, and a platoon plus of Romanians in Poland at any one mm. time. Th things have changed a lot, I believe, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in, in February 2022. You mean they fortified even more? You I mean? think, yeah. Right, that's right. So, they, yeah. You, so you mean they might have other alliances, you're saying, to the protect them? They're part of the NATO uh, right, alliance, of course, okay, so, right. so other NATO allies. might come in you know, and set up mm. you know, camp there mm. or bases. Mm. <laughs> so tell me, so now that you, so then you retired from there, now what do we find you doing nowadays? So uh, um, retired uh, almost exactly four years ago. My wife is Japanese, my second wife is Japanese, and so um, uh, we decided to settle here in, in Japan. She's an only daughter, and so. Mm. Um, Have you been married long? Twenty years. Oh, twenty years. Mm. Okay, 20 so plus. she's with you. Oh, so mm. okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's a uh, uh, retired banker, and so um, we were able to uh, spend the four years together in Romania. But prior to that, we we usually were um, living in different countries. Uh, but still married. Still married. Okay. Um, Anyway, we decided to settle here in, in, okay. in Tokyo. And then, uh, yeah, so this was just before COVID. Uh, and then my, my intention was to find something to do. Uh, I still had the energy uh, and the interest in finding a job, but it was really hard uh, in, in 2020 uh, after COVID hit, a lot of, you know, a lot of companies uh, uh, stopped uh, hiring and, and, and then it was difficult to travel in and out of, of Japan. So for the first two years after uh, coming back, I really focused one on trying to rebuild my Japanese, and so I hired a tutor and, um, in order to build my network, uh, reconstruct my network here. I joined the chamber as an independent uh, uh, member and did some volunteer work. Um, Chamber launched this project on digital transformation. Uh, this was in the summer of 2020 in, um, in partnership with McKinsey. So I worked on a little task force to help put together that white paper. Um, and also did some, uh, took some continuing studies courses, uh, which was You've a got lot some of fun. more encyclopedias, you're telling me? <laughs> Is that exactly. What you're trying to tell me? Good memory, good memory. Uh, and, but then, uh, uh, so right now I'm working for Pharma, which is the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of, of America. It's a trade organization based in Washington, D.C. as their Japan representative. Mm -hmm. And I started there about uh, two years ago. Um, the Pharma's had an office in, uh, and it's a trade organization. It's, its membership is made up of, of the major pharmaceutical companies uh, mm -hmm. in the world, not only right. in America, but also mm -hmm. European. We, are, we have six ja Japan companies who are also members. Um, and we've had a, an office here in Tokyo since 1987. Okay. And um, there's been a history now of former U.S. government officials who have served as the Japan representative. And uh, you m might remember Amy Jackson, um, Ira Wolf. Ira Wolf, I know, yes. So he was my predecessor's predecessor. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I know, I, but I, didn't, I don't think I really knew. He was under me when I was president of the American Chamber. Right. And we had so many. I think during my term, we had more groups than they ever had because mm. we made the second largest income in the 55 mm. year history of the mm. chamber, even mm. though we try to break even at the end of every mm. year. Mm. We're not mm. a we're nonprofit organization right. Right. still. Right. Um, yeah, I'm now a member of the board. Oh, yeah? Governors. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was on that for a long time. Mm. For a long we'll talk during breakfast about okay. that. <laughs> we can talk about that then. Listen, before I end the, Hans, before mm. I end the podcast, there's a question I always like to mm. ask everyone. Mm. 
If you could magically go back in time, mm -hmm. knowing what you know today, mm -hmm. and meet the younger Hans and give mm -hmm. him information mm -hmm. or give him advice, mm -hmm. how old would he be and what advice would you give him? Yeah, maybe uh, 22, 23 years old and, and I'd tell, tell him to be more serious and work harder. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any better advice than that. <laughs> thank you so much, Hans. Thank you, Les. I want to thank all of you for watching or listening to this podcast. And always remember, it's all on loan, so continue to reach for the stars. Because you're too blessed to be stressed. Mm -hmm.